In this video, I'm going to give you a guided example of developing a Verilog test bench. I'll be talking through my thought processes as I go along and showing you how to do things like set up the data types, instantiate the device under test and determine the test vectors. The tasks in this session are centered around designing test benches and you'll be needing to do it throughout the rest of the semester. So it's best that you get as comfortable with it as you can now. The design we're going to be testing is the 4-bit full adder module that was the guided example in the previous lab session. You can either use the same project from that session, as we're not going to be adjusting the design itself, or creating a new project for this and add a copy of the 1 and 4-bit adders to it. Once again, I'll be using my sandbox module, so the designs are already there for me. Okay, so first things first, we're going to create a new Verilog file, which will become our test bench. Remembering the test bench structure, we'll set the timescale first. As this is purely a functional simulation and our circuit doesn't have a clock, the timescale doesn't really matter. It's only going to affect the length of each test vector in the simulation, so we'll stick to a 1 nanosecond, 100 picosecond resolution. I'll now declare our test bench module, full out of 4-bit underscore TB. And as this is a test bench, there aren't any ports, so there's no need for brackets. We can just terminate with a semicolon and then stick our end module statement in. I'm going to save at this point, naming our test bench file after the module. I tend to save every few lines or so due to past traumatic experiences with losing huge amounts of code, so I suggest you do the same. Okay, so first up is our declaration of data types. I've pulled the adders design file up so we can remind ourselves of the ports it has. We've got two 4-bit inputs, A and B, a single bit input for carry in, a 4-bit output for sum, and a 1-bit output for carry out. So within our test bench, we'll need to include these inputs and outputs as registers and wires respectively, making sure that any widths match. Now I'm going to give the data types the same name as the ports of our device under test. This is good practice for simulations like this, where we're testing a design on its own out of context. But if your design was to be applied in a system, then these data types might be representative of other parts of the system, and would therefore need more appropriate names. Next job is to instantiate our device under test. Doing this follows the same protocol for instantiating a sub-module in a Verilog design file. We instantiate it as the full adder 4-bit type, name it DUT for device under test, and then open the interface to connect the ports. We'll take a quick look at the design file to double check the order of the ports as they have to match up, and then connect them to our registers and wires. So we've got A, B, C in, sum, then C out. Note that I'm not including any width information here. For the ports which are more than one bit wide, just giving the identifier connects the entire bus. If we wanted to specify individual or ranges of bits within the bus, we'd have to address them like we did in the previous lab session. But as we've designed our registers to match our ports, it's a much simpler process. I'm going to pause to compile at this point. Running frequent compilations is the best way to check your syntax as you go along. In the past, you may have used development environments which have things like syntax and automatic reference checking, but there are no such quality of life features with Quartus. We actually have to get good at the syntax to avoid having to change every line after compilation. Luckily, syntax checking takes place in the earlier stages of compilation. Therefore, we can get away with just doing analysis and elaboration instead of waiting for a full compile. So now that we've got our design instantiated, we can start to generate our test vectors. But first, we should probably think about what we're actually going to test. Our design is a 4-bit full adder, so primarily we want to make sure that it correctly adds up to 4-bit numbers. We also have our carry-in, which can completely change the result of the addition, so we'll want to test some numbers with the carry-in flag set to high. In terms of any critical cases in the output, we'll want to be looking for a correct generation of the carry-out flag, but that's about it. As it's a 4-bit adder, we've got nine different input wires, the two 4-bit inputs and our carry-in flag. This gives us 512 different input combinations, which is a lot, but we can still feasibly test every possible combination in a short space of time. As it's a simple design, we're only really going to take a cursory glance at the output to verify the results. We'll be looking at a more robust automated solution in the coming weeks. So skimming over that number of output values should also be okay. 
So in terms of test schedule, we'll test all possible input combinations for a carry-in flag of zero, and then all possible combinations for when the flag is set high. So we'll start with our initial block. We'll set C into zero, and then start building our for loop to generate the test vectors. We need an integer declared to act as our loop counter, and this needs to be done outside of the procedural block. We can then use this counter to construct our for loop. So how many iterations does this loop need to run for? Well, we want to test every possible value of A for every possible value of B. So we can treat A and B as one binary number, with B being the four most significant bits and A being the four least significant. That way, as the integer counts up, we apply all values of A, add one to B, and then start again. By the time we reach overflow, every value of A will have been tested for every value of B. Therefore, the loop needs to run for 2 to the power 8 iterations, or 256. Within our for loop, we can concatenate our B and A buses into one 8-bit bus and just set the value to the value of the loop counter. We then add in an arbitrary delay afterwards to make our test vectors sequential. So that's all we really need for our first set of tests. I'll just compile this quickly to check my syntax and then we can make a start on the second set. So now we'll set carry into 1, and repeat the above for loop to generate all our values again. So that's it for our test vectors. We've managed to test all 512 values in just 15 lines of code. So now we'll add some display statements and a stop position and compile again, then we can move on to simulating. Note how often I'm compiling here. You should all be well into this habit by now. It's far easier to debug the last three lines of code you wrote than it is an entire module at once. So our final compilation was successful, and we can now start the simulation. Oh, so you may recognize this as the simulation results for the one bit adder. As I'm using the same project that I used for the last screencast, Quarter still thinks that I want to run the one bit adder test bench, so we're gonna have to change it over. We can do this by following the same procedure that we use to add a new test bench. We go to the hierarchy pane in the project navigator, right click on the device and click settings. We can see in the drop down box that all I have is the currently selected test bench, which is the one for the one bit adder. So we'll need to open the test benches dialog and create a new one. We'll call it after our test bench module name and select the file from our project folder. Again, make sure you click Add here. It's very easy to forget, and you'll just end up with errors if you don't. Once we click OK, we can select our new test bench from the drop-down box, and Quarters will know that that's the one we want to run.
So that's better. The simulation has finished and the results are displayed here. It always starts with this really zoomed in view of the last test vector. So we'll use the zoom all button to get a good look at the whole signal. So the first thing we'll look at is which signals are which. Over here we can see that from the top down we've got A, B, C in, sum C out and our loop counter I. ModelSim has grouped the multibit signals which makes everything nice and easy to read. They're displayed in the wave window in binary. Before we switch them over to decimal, let's zoom in and see the incrementing test values in action. So we can see that at the very start of our test, everything is set to zero. And then we increment A step by step. And once it overflows, we add one to B. So as we scroll along, we can see the values incrementing, the result being generated. Once we get to an addition which results in an overflow, we can see that the carry out flag is generated correctly. We can change the radix of the two inputs and the sum outputs so we can visually check whether or not the addition is correct, without having to translate from binary. Make sure to change the radix to unsigned, otherwise you'll start to get incorrect values displayed when the most significant bit is 1. So we can now see that our system is adding 8 and 1 and getting 9, 9 and 1 and getting 10, and so on and so forth, until it overflows at 15 plus 1. Our result is 0, and the carry out flag is generated. If we zoom out, we can see the overflow state occurring for more and more A values as our value of B increases, which is what we'd expect of this system. Finally, if we scroll along, we can see where our second stage of testing takes place. Carry in is set to high, the values of A and B are reset, and the counting starts again. If we zoom into this point, we can see this in action, Even though our value of b is 0, the sum is equal to a plus 1. So that's about all there is to see here. As I said, it's a very simple system and therefore doesn't require really robust checking of the output. In the coming weeks, we're going to start looking at developing self-checking test benches, so we don't even have to look at the waveforms to know if our designs are correct. But for now, it's good to get used to the simulation tools we have available here.